we're talking on this program these days about one of the phenomena that all of us experience in our own personal lives. It's the Jekyll and Hyde syndrome. And uh, I don't know if you know immediately what that is, but it takes its name from the famous novel written by Robert Louis Stevenson called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And you may remember how Dr. Jekyll was a respected, loving, well-known doctor in a certain area of London who was famous for his philanthropic uh, treatment of the poor and the needy. And uh, yet there appeared on the streets of London at night when uh, people would roam the streets who were most vulnerable to this kind of creature, there roamed the streets of that area of London at night a creature called Mr. Hyde, who became known for his murderous and violent treatment of strangers in the street. And, of course, you remember how in some way he became connected with the Dr. Jekyll through uh, having presented a check for £100 as compensation to one of his victims. And uh, you may remember how we discussed the suicide note that Dr. Jekyll left after he had committed suicide at the end of the novel. And in it, he described how he had those generous and kindly feelings that everybody knew him for, but along with those, he had within him cruel, angry feelings of violence and greed and selfishness and lust and hatred that he could not control. And so he devised a drug, you remember, that was intended to give a physical expression that was appropriate to those angry, callous, cruel feelings. And he would take that drug, you remember, at the beginning once a week, and then his features would assume those of the cruel and violent Mr. Hyde. But, of course, he became addicted to the drug, and as the years passed, Mr. Hyde took over more and more of his life, until gradually, without any need of the drug at all, Mr. Hyde's cruel and violent features would take over from the kindly elderly Dr. Jekylls, and Hyde actually took control of the life completely so that Jekyll had no more control of his own attitude or his own behavior. And what we have said is that most of us here have some experience of that in our own lives. Indeed, we mentioned, you remember, a famous statement of that that you find in actually part of the Bible towards the end of it in a book called Romans in chapter 7 of that book and verse 15 the words occur, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And that was exactly what Dr. Jekyll found. And if you're like me, and many of the rest of us human beings, you've found that to be true in your own life. I do not do the good I want, but I do the very thing I hate. In other words, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde has become a classic partly because it describes a phenomenon that is universal in human nature. The Jekyll and Hyde syndrome is something that all of us know in our own everyday lives. We know the reality of that conflict within. We know that there are times when we want to be gentle with another person, and yet we find ourselves being harsh and sarcastic. When we most want to be pure, we find lustful, licentious passions rising from hearts of darkness. When we most want to be industrious and useful, we find ourselves overwhelmed with indolence and lethargy, so that our wills seem impotent to stem the tide of foulness and evil that seems to rise up from our hearts like a flood tide. So all of us, I think, know the reality of that cry of, actually, it was a man called Paul who said, I do not do the good I want. But the evil I hate is what I do. And probably you've had the experience of going home at night determined to give your wife or your children or the person you live with a beautiful experience of happiness and rest and relaxation. And you determine that you will be the best that you have ever been before. And then you find that your wife has not got the supper or the tea or the dinner ready, 
on time, or you find that the dog has got out and you have to go out and look for it, or you find that your newspaper has been opened by somebody else and has been torn, and suddenly you become a little irritable, and as act follows act and word follows word and you express your irritability and your wife or your roommate or your friend responds in a certain way and you respond a little more harshly and before you know it you're into the middle of one of those disastrous evenings where the whole domestic unity has been split apart and everybody goes to bed uh, really fed up and insulted and tired of each other. So most of us know the reality of that Mr. Hyde within us that comes out when it is least convenient for us. What's the answer to it? Suicide was the only answer for Dr. Jekyll. He and Hyde had become so entangled that the only way to get rid of one was to kill both. In a strange way, if you find no solution, something like that will happen anyway. The evil part of you will finally have to be killed, or it will kill the good in you, so that you may, though you may still appear somewhat good on the outside, it'll be a veneer, and all your good will be shot through with this old evil creature that rises up in violence. So in a sense... There has to be the destruction of one or the other. And in most of us, of course, as the years pass, there is. And gradually, the evil part takes over more and more. It just clothes itself in a more subtle form so that we find ourselves doing good acts, but often for evil motives or evil reasons. Or we often find ourselves saying nice things to a per person, but our attitude does not really mirror what we're saying to them. So many of us, we call ourselves hypocrites because we are, what that word implies, someone who looks like one thing on the outside, and yet that is only a mask, such as they wore in the old Greek dramas, and inside is the real person. But really, we're not hypocrites because we're as really ourselves when we're the evil part as when we're the good part. It's just that, that we like to think of ourselves better than we ought to think. And so we like to pretend to ourselves that the evil part is, of course, not really us, but in fact it is us. How do you get rid of that? Drugs? Shock treatment? Well, you know, they're as temporary and as enslaving as Jekyll's original drug. And they merely deal with the symptoms but they leave the underlying case untouched, as most of us find who try to treat ourselves, however mildly, with some kind of drug. The power of positive thinking, will that answer it? Self-discipline? Behavior modification? Most of us have found that it's like trying to tame a lion with cookies. It's like trying to stop an overwhelming avalanche with one shovel. It's like trying to stem a tidal wave with a picket fence. The power and the force and the complexity and the depth of the evil nature that we find within us is too powerful to be dealt with by such tampering and tinkering. And so most of us find ourselves in the same position as Dr. Jekyll, except that we cannot find any answer or solution to the problem. And, of course, for most of us, it is a bewildering and a baffling problem. We wonder, why does it occur? Why am I not, as uh, old Rex Harris would sing in My Fair Lady, why am I not a most understanding man? I seem in every way to be civilized and sophisticated and kindly and understanding on the outside, and yet within me I find at times this violent, ugly monster that I cannot control. It's just as Boswell said, uh, who wrote The Famous Life of Johnson, he said, at times I can be sitting in church thinking the most holy thoughts, and suddenly I can think of having a woman. And so most of us have had that kind of experience, the experience of this apparent twin personality within us, this schizophrenia, uh, 
this ugly, cruel creature underneath that we cannot control. What is the explanation of that? Let's discuss it a little further.